Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It is time to study some more of God's Word tonight. So uh, we're going to get ready to rock and roll through Second Peter uh, chapter 2 tonight. We won't get through chapter 2. We're going to get through a few verses and that's it. So uh, just uh, go ahead and prepare you already. We're not going to get any further than that, but uh, looking forward to talking about what we are going to talk about. Um, we may have a little problem here. We're trying to get figured out. We're live on the um, on um, our page, and we're just trying to see if... Are we live on the other page? On our page? Yeah. It's all right. They'll find us. So uh, we're trying something different tonight. Uh, something's happened to our, our Facebook account to where I can no longer do some things that I was doing on the Harbor of Hope Church page. So uh, now I do it on Sonia and I's page. So uh, that's why we're doing live tonight on our page. And here is uh, my little buddy who's wanting to help me teach tonight. So uh, say hi. Yep, she said hi. Um, I do have a couple of announcements tonight. Uh, we, our food pantry has taken a big hit. We have, uh, uh, a food pantry. Harbor of Hope, uh, has a pantry of hopes, what we call it. And, uh, we have a lot of people that, that we get to bless and help with food. And this week we've got to help families. And, uh, so we are very low on food. Uh, so any Harbor of Hopers out there, you would like to bring some food in, uh, Sunday, uh, we would really appreciate it, but it's exciting to know that we're able to help, help families. Uh, that's what we're wanting to do. So also this, uh, well, let's go Thursday. There is no prayer meeting thir tomorrow night, Thursday night, because we had it last night at Craig County. Uh, so, uh, no prayer meeting tomorrow night since we've already had it. And then Sunday is, uh, we're just going to call it a solemn assembly. We're going to Sunday to pray. Uh, we're praying for uh, the election, our country. Uh, there's just a lot to be, you know, to pray about. Um, so uh, our worship pastor, Clayton Kipps, the assistant pastor, Josh Collins, and myself, we're all going to have uh, different parts that we're going to pray uh, throughout the service Sunday morning. So as I announced this past Sunday, come ready to pray. It's going to be a unique service, but you know, we're wanting to make Harbor of Hope a house of prayer. Like Jesus said, he said, my house should be called a house of prayer. And that's what we're going to do. So, uh, we're just going to come seeking the Lord's face and interceding for our country. And each one of us are going to pray specific, uh, for specific needs. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, so come, come ready, you know, be ready to seek God, uh, fast, be, uh, in prayer about how you can fast before Sunday and on Sunday. And, and let's just seek and, uh, it's going to be a good day. Second Peter. So you got your Bibles. You better get to second Peter right now. And we're going to jump in here. Let's go ahead and pray. And, uh, we're just going to ask God's blessings on, on tonight's class. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful for uh, your blessings that has that have been through upon us all day and that you've been with us throughout this day, Lord God. Thank you for your abiding presence, for your goodness and mercy. Uh, just thank you, Lord God, for blessing us. And we're not worthy, Lord God. You, you, you have given us all the blessings that we have in our lives. We righteousness. We have. There's no work we can do to be saved. You. It's all about you and your work on the cross, Lord Jesus. And we just thank you. Grace, thank you for grace, unmerited favor. We're just so grateful for your grace tonight, Lord. And um, we're thankful for the word. We thank you that, Lord, we can open up your word tonight and learn how to grow as Christians as we learned last week. And then as tonight about the dangers to a growing Christian and false teachings and false prophets, Lord. I just pray that wisdom would be would be delivered tonight and received. And I just pray your blessings upon each person that will that will that is taking part in this live class tonight. Bless them, Lord, with, with wisdom tonight. Bless them tonight with understanding. And may we just be united through this virtual class, Lord God. Uh, I just pray, Lord God, that, that tonight we would just be united. Our hearts, our spirit, Lord God, would be united. 
and just be glorified in the teaching of your word. We love you, we praise you, and we magnify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen, amen. All right, so just sort of review where we was last week. We have a, a guide for uh, Second Peter, our blueprint. We're going to talk about how uh, in chapter 1, guidance, uh, we talked last week about guidance for Christian living. Uh, chapter 2, titled Dangers to Christian Living, and, and 3 could be titled Hope for the Growing Christian. Um, uh, as I said earlier, we're not going to get far into Second Peter chapter 2 at all because we're going to really hone in on false teachings tonight. Last week, we talked about a growing Christian, and uh, we talked about how uh, there were three words that Peter uses a lot in his writings, uh, Lord, knowledge, and precious. Uh, we talked about what those things meant. Uh, and then we got into how Peter taught us that, that God has given us everything we need to live a godly life. And, and we could really just narrow that down to the Holy Spirit that he has given us and the Word of God. Uh, that's all we need. You know, we have the Spirit of God. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Just to think about that is enough. He's everything we need. And then we have the Word of God that we, that we can dive into, that we can... Uh, study and, and, and learn about. And he tells us everything we need to know about how to walk and live a godly life. He has, he has we, we made this comment, God deposits his divine nature into our heart drive. Amen. Um, then we got into the old tomato vine example, right? We talked about how Peter taught us how to uh, supplement our faith or add to our faith. Um, and we talked about how that was like that tomato vine, and you put stakes and wires and the fencing, and all this stuff is just to stabilize that, that vine, that tomato vine, to allow it to grow and produce those tomatoes. And our faith is the same way. This thing started with our faith. Our relationship with the Lord starts by that measure of faith that we step out on, that we believe that Jesus died on the cross for us. He rose from the dead. And now we start to add to our faith, supplement it with moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, patience, godliness, and uh, brotherly affection, and then love for everyone. Um, we talked about how Peter was a good coach because he told the, uh, his, the believers, the, the church there at that time, he said, I'm going to remind you of things, even though they might be fundamentals. He said, I'm still going to remind you of these things. Yeah, you know them already. I'm just going to keep on rehearsing them to you. And it's like a coach, a coach that continues to, 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 to teach the fundamentals of a, of a sport. An athlete who continues to practice and make sure that they know the fundamentals. Uh, like, uh, for instance, blocking and tackling in football or shooting a free throw. And don't lose a game by not being able to tackle. Don't lose a game by missing your free throws, right? Those are fundamentals. So keep on. And, and our example then is the Word of God. There are some things that me as a pastor, I'm going to keep preaching on. It, and, and we already know them, but we're going to be, be good at the fundamentals. Another, The Great Commission, knowing what our enemy wants to do and how he wants to destroy and divide the church. We're always going to keep those fundamentals before us so that we're always thinking about them and practicing them. Amen? Amen. Um, so let's just go ahead and jump into this week. Uh, we're going to title this because of the blueprint, Dangers to the Growing Christian. Uh, but we're going to start out in chapter 1 before we jump into chapter 2. So um, chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 says, For we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. When he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice from the majestic glory of God to him, this is my dearly loved son, who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven with when we were with him on the holy mount, talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. Verse 19, because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. So he's reminded of all the holy prophets have 
spoke and God has given them messages and they have had recorded that they were studying that they knew. Now they experienced God's glory. They experienced, they saw Jesus. They knew he was the Messiah. They heard God speak from heaven. So this just amped up their belief in what the holy prophets had been preparing them for. As concerning the Messiah, uh, he pay attention to what they wrote, for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No. Those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. So he is, he is backing up the words of the prophets by, by these words. Those prophets, they, this was not something that they did themselves. When they wrote these, these words down that we have recorded, they were moved by the Holy Spirit to write what they wrote. That reminds me of what 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17 says. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it, the scriptures, to prepare and equip his people to do every good. So here Peter is emphasizing his authority as an eyewitness of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, hearing God the Father pronounce that declaration of his acceptance over the Son, right? He heard God the Father speaking from heaven. So he is emphasizing his authority to be able to write down these things as an apostle, okay? Um, and then, as, as well, he's also emphasizing the, the, the authority of the prophets because they were inspired by God. And remember, the things the prophets wrote about concerning the Messiah, Peter knew had come to pass. So he was realizing that all these things that the prophets that they didn't understand them hundreds of years before as God was preparing his people. He was going to send a Messiah. He was going to send a Messiah. He was going to send a Messiah. All these prophecies like where Jesus was born, his death, his resurrection, his suffering, uh, everything about his life, they all come to pass in Jesus. Now, Peter is an eyewitness, so he's emphasizing the authority of the apostles and the authority of the scriptures, of the prophets, to, for us to realize that, hey, we can take these words and found, ground, found our lives upon them. Amen? Um, he's preparing the way, though, for his attack on false prophets. So he's emphasizing the apostles' authority and the authority of the prophets and the scriptures, getting ready to attack all those false prophets who are, who are making people go down the wrong path, who are causing people to to believe lies, okay? In other words, Peter is saying, if anyone comes to you speaking words that contradict the apostles or the Bible, their message cannot be from God. In chapter 2, Peter started talking about the dangers of false teachers and false prophets to the believers. Dangers to the growing Christian. Grow A Christian who's growing, you get, you get start getting feedback from a false teacher, it can cause you to, to totally get off track. And that's, that's all an attempt of the enemy to try to get you deterred from the way of truth, okay? False prophets contradict true prophets of God. Now, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. He says, But there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. Now he's relating back to Israel and the days of Jeremiah, Isaiah, the prophets. He says, they will cleverly teach destructive heresies. A heresy is a belief contrary to Christian doctrine. It says, and deny, even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. 
Many will follow their evil teachings and, sh and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. So he makes the point to make a reference with Israel. And he said there were prophets. It's back in Israel's day, just as there are going to be false prophets among you in the present day. Let's, let's read some scripture from Jeremiah's day in Jeremiah chapter 23 about what was going on in his day concerning false prophets. It says in verse 16, Jeremiah 23, This is what the Lord of heaven's army says to his people. Do not listen to these prophets when they prophesy to you, filling you with futile hopes. They are making up everything they say. They do not speak for the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise my word, don't worry, the Lord says you will have peace. And to those who stubbornly follow their own desires, they say, no harm will come your way. Verse 25 says, I have heard these prophets say, listen to the dream I had from God last night. And then they proceed to tell lies in my name. How long will this go on? If they are prophets, they are prophets of deceit, inventing everything they say. By telling these false dreams, they are trying to get my people to forget me, just as their ancestors did by worshiping the idols of Baal. Woo! So they were telling the people what they wanted to hear. They were despising the word of God, yet these false prophets were coming in and, say, coming in and saying, Oh, don't worry. Oh, you'll have peace. They were following their own desires, and these false prophets were saying, Oh, no harm will come your way. But the true prophets of God were saying things that were stern and strict to these rebellious hearts. Amen. And God was trying to warn them. They weren't worried about offending the people. They were worried about the people not repenting of their sin and having to, to, to answer to God, all right? But these false prophets, they were all about pleasing the people, right? So that's, that's, that's where we've got to realize that, that this is a danger to a growing Christian. We have got to understand that we have around us today false teachers, false prophets, we have so many platforms nowadays. Anybody, any anybody can get on Facebook Live and start talking. Anybody can get on YouTube. We have all these social media outlets. We have all these TV preachers. And in case you don't know, news alert, everybody that's on TV preaching, not all of them's not preaching the truth. And if you don't get in the word and make sure that they are, you could potentially fall into this, this deception. So that's why tonight we're going to ask this question, how do we identify false teachers or false prophets? All right? We're going to take it straight from these scriptures and some other scriptures that the Lord has, has put on my heart. So first of all tonight, we have to realize that the Lord has given us the promise of the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit who is, who is within us, and the Bible calls him our helper, our advocate, our comforter. He comes alongside of us. He's with us. It's like our, he's like our personal coach. Amen? So with that thought, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 through 11, it says, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. We, God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another and to someone else. The one Spirit gives the gift of healing. 
gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. Listen to this. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Back, back up to verse 10, he gives someone else the ability to, to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another person. There are gifts of the Spirit. And we're supposed to be praying that God gives us gifts of the Spirit. Make sure, though, we do not get gifts above the fruit. All right? Fruit is what it's all about. He goes on talking in chapter 12, verse 1 Corinthians chapter 12, about the gifts of the Spirit. But then he starts in chapter 13. He, he starts, ends chapter 12 by saying, but I'll show you a better way. And starts chapter 13, the love chapter. Do not let gifts become greater than the fruit. There's a lot of people out there in the world that, that talk and boast about their great gifts from God and start speaking in tongues and then go cuss somebody out around the corner and judge and criticize. Come on. That, that should not be coming out of the same mouth. All right? I would much rather have love than all the gifts that, uh, in, 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 in the world, right? Just, just give me love, right? But we're to pray. We're to pray for gifts. Uh, this gift right here, the gift of discernment, is what I want to really hone in on. We're talking about how do we identify false teachers or false prophets when we have the helper, the Holy Spirit, who dwells within us. And, and pray. Ask God to give you the spirit of discernment. Holy Spirit, help me to discern whether or not this person's preaching is true or not. Have you ever been listening to a sermon or a teaching and something just didn't seem right about what that person was teaching on? Uh, you felt like there was some red flags going up. It was like, I've, I've heard that preached before, but I sure didn't hear it preached like that, right? Have you ever been around someone and feel a little uneasy like, what, what, why did I just now feel that around that person? Red flags were going up. That, what, that was weird. And I mean, this could even happen, this, this can happen in church. I'm talking about even in church. And I'm just going to be honest with you right now. I've met some preachers that when I got around them, there was just something I didn't feel right. I was just like, what was that? What was that feeling? Next thing you know, there's information that comes out that tells me that was the spirit of discernment that I was feeling because something had happened with that minister that, that it ended up being real bad. It was just a bad ordeal. And I was just like, wow. And here I felt that spirit, that, that weird feeling from inside my spirit. Just like this is not, it was like the spirit checked me on, on, on that person. I heard teachings before and I was just like, I, what's up with that? What is going on there? The Spirit of the Lord is helping you to discern that what, what, what's going on there is not bearing witness with the Word of God, is not bearing witness with truth. That's, that's what I'm saying. We have the Spirit of God, so we need to ask God to give us that, that discernment. Holy Spirit, give me discernment when it comes to this weird feeling that I'm feeling, or if I'm hearing some preaching on TV, or if I'm, if you're listening to that Craig Reed guy, you better pray for discernment, right? Come on, no, I'm just picking. You just make sure you get in the Bible. If you have any questions, you ask me, all right? We'll talk about it. But I'm just asking, have you ever felt that? That was discernment. That was the Lord trying to lead you to truth, because whoever that was, whatever that teaching was, it was, it was not true. Um, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit is here and, and we need to ask him for help because the Lord said he's our helper, right? So that is the first way we can identify a false teacher is, is by that spirit of discernment with some red flags that start going up. Oh, what was, what was that all about? And then start checking the word of God and seeing if, if that, that is the truth or not. Next, straight out of Second Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, 
He says, they will cleverly teach destructive heresies. So these false teachers, they, they know how to use smooth speech. They know how to manipulate their words in such a way that it seems like they're preaching truth, but in the end, it's not, it's not truth, okay? Now listen to Ma Jesus. I mean, Peter here is getting this straight from Jesus, y'all. Remember, he followed Jesus. He was the disciple of Jesus. He was there, heard his teachings. He was there when Jesus was teaching. When we read Matthew chapter 24, those, those prophecies about the end times, Peter was there and he heard Jesus preaching and teaching. Matthew 24, 11, he says, and many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. One of the signs of the end times, there's going to be many false prophets around and they will be deceiving people. Today, when I think about that, I think about how we have around us today so many religious cults. We have so many false doctrines that are around that people get sucked into like the prosperity gospel, all right? And people start thinking that, hey, now that I'm a Christian, I'm supposed to have all this wealth and the best health. And when Jesus, you know, he, he said that in this world we would have tribulation. Does God want to bless his children? Sure, absolutely. We're God's children. But that doesn't mean he promises the best road and the, uh, no problems ever again. No. That, that, we're a disciple of Christ. And he said that you're going to be hated by the world because you're a Christian. All right, but a prosperity gospel and his preaching makes makes everybody think that everything's going to be perfect now that you're a Christian. And then when bad things start happening, like Jesus said, what happened? Then it it makes people want to want to say, "What is up with this? I forget you, Jesus. I I thought I was supposed to have you know a problem free life now. See, this is prosperity gospels messing with people. It's causing people to get bitter with God because what happened to me having everything that I want, right? How about the false doctrines of grace? That we can accept God's grace, God's unmerited favor, and we can go on and live however we want to live now because God's grace is going to cover it. It's a false doctrine. All right? We, how shall we continue in sin when, when, when we, we're dead to sin, right? Shall we continue in sin, Paul said, that grace can abound? He said, God forbid. How shall you that are dead to sin continue any longer in it, right? So we need to be, be trying to be like Jesus, not just going buck wild and doing whatever we want to do and saying, oh, grace will cover it. We can go live however we want to live now. You know, people are living that way because preachers are preaching that. And that's a false doctrine. I'm just saying, Matthew 24, 24, it says false for false messiahs and false prophets will rise up at the last days and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. But listen, Jesus said, but see, I have warned you about this ahead of time. Jesus was warning us. He, Behold, I told you before it even happened that it was going to happen so that when it happens, you'll know that that's a lie, that's false, I know the truth, I'm not going to be deceived. And I've often wondered about those scriptures. How will that materialize? He says that these false prophets, false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders as to deceive, even if possible, God's very elect, God's chosen ones. I've often wondered at how that will materialize. Will it involve magic? I don't know. You know, we got these street magicians that are out there doing all these crazy, crazy magic tricks, you know, and all these optical illusions and all that. And I'm just wondering, is that going to be some kind of darkness that the enemy uses to, to, to try to get people lured in to deception and, and these people are doing these crazy things and it's all an illusion? Will it, will it deal with the occult? I've thought about that. Or will this just be the great deception from the smooth talking antichrist? And he comes on the scene and he wins people's favor with his smooth talk and his power and his authority. Will that be the great deception? And people start following the Antichrist. And Jesus said, Behold, I already told you. 
Now, many Christians are, are going to say, well, we won't be here. We won't have to worry about that. Well, why did Jesus say, behold, I told you before so that you wouldn't be deceived? So we better be ready. False teachers are all around us right now. And I believe it's a matter of, of, of days, months. Shortly, I believe the Antichrist is going to start this, 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 this rise to the top. I really do. I believe we're that close to the return of the Lord. I do, my friends, with all that's going on. Um, so anyhow, Jesus warned us. He said, look out, because these clever teachers, they are going to suck people in with their smooth talk and try to get people just deceived by their clever speech and teaching. It's going to cause people to start following heres gospel, I mean, false gospel. I mean, beliefs contrary to Christian doctrine. Isn't that something? And we see it around us today. Peter says that they will even deny the master who bought them. The master, capital M, they will deny Jesus. 1 John chapter 4 helps us to understand this a little bit more. He says in verse 1, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. That goes back to, to him saying that some prophets say, well, I had a dream, I had a vision. Let me tell you what the Lord says, right? So he says, don't believe everybody that comes to you saying the Spirit says to do this. He says, you must test them to see if the Spirit they have come, that they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. Now listen, he says, this is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which, ha you, which you have heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. These teachers, these false teachers, he says they will deny the master who bought them. These false teachers will belittle the significance of Jesus' life, Jesus' death, and Jesus' resurrection. Which things we're holding on to because those are the works that, that, that built our salvation. Jesus' life, he was perfect. He fulfilled the law. His death on the cross, he, it was, that was the righteous dying for the unrighteous, the spotless lamb of God. He was dying in our place. He was taking our sin debt. He became sin who knew no sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. His resurrection, he overcome death, hell, Satan, sin. You belittle his life, his death, and his resurrection, you've neglected salvation, right? So if anybody comes along and belittles Jesus, belittles his life, belittles his death, belittles his resurrection, that's a false prophet. They've denied the master who bought them. We're talking about how do we identify false teachers, false prophets. Every year around Easter, every year around Christmas, there's these documentaries I start seeing as I'm channel surfing, looking for something good to watch. It's talking about different aspects of Jesus' life, and, and, and a lot of it will water his life down. A lot of this stuff will say that he had a girlfriend. He was dating Mary Magdalene. You know, all these things. That's why some of the Gospels, like that people will start talking about the hidden Gospels, the, the, the Gospels that, why didn't the, uh, Thomas's Gospel make it in or Judas, the Gospel of Judas. It's because when you start reading it and comparing it with the other eyewitness disciples accounts, it was so far-fetched, you could tell it was false. It was, it was made up. It was heresy, all right? It did not make it into the canon of the New Testament. That's why when you make the comparisons, why, how did they see something that the others did not see? So it, anyhow... Anybody that comes saying they're speaking in the Spirit and they start denying Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, they start belittling it, it, all those things, false prophet. 
false teacher. All right. Next, he says, many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. So here's three points to, to remember about a false teacher. Their teachings are evil. Again, the spirit of discernment. We will know red flags will go up when they start teaching. And we're going to sense this uneasiness. We'll know this is not right. Okay? Number two, they condone, approve of shameful immorality. So in other words, if you hear somebody speaking light of immoral living, red flag, red flag, where is this cat coming from, right? And number three, they slander the way of truth. In other words, they water the truth down. They compromise the truth. Again, Peter says, in their greed, they will make up clever lies to get a hold of your money. Now, this is where it gets ugly, right? These false teachers are more interested in making money than they are fulfilling ministry. <clears throat> they are more interested in making money than they are in preaching the truth. They are afraid to preach truth because really, they're afraid that they're going to offend somebody who has deep pockets in their congregation. Come on. False teachers out of their greed are clever and it's all about the money to them. False teachers, these false teachers, these false prophets are people pleasers. They want to please people. They definitely don't want to offend anybody because that'll hinder their giving. They want to make sure they please the people and tell the people exactly what they want to hear in order to keep the giving up. All right? They're greedy and they want money. The same, all right, happened in the Old Testament. Uh, Balaam, same thing. Because of greed, he, he disobeyed God. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 4, it brings this out a little bit more. We're living in, all right? This is a sad, sad reality, but this is the day that we're living in. He says in 2 Timothy 4, as urging a young preacher, he says, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will sol someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom, preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Then he says this, For a time is coming, and may I just say it's today, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound doctrine and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths, fiction, and invention, or a falsehood. So, there, there are false teachers around today who want to cater to people pleasers. And these these people who want to reject the truth, who don't want to accept the truth because of their own desires, they're looking for a preacher who will pat them on their back like the, oh, the prophets in Jeremiah's day when they were in sin was not following God's word. And they'll say, oh, no, it's okay. You'll be okay. God, God, will, God will forgive you. God will, he'll look after you. God's grace will cover you. It'll be all right. It'll be okay. So these people who want to stay in their sin but yet feel all right to sit in church, got to find them a preacher who will be a people pleaser. And guess what? They're finding them. And these preachers... They start preaching to build up crowds and keep the money coming in. So therefore, they don't preach anything that's going to offend anybody. And there are churches full of people, of people-pleasing preachers today 
who don't preach against sin anymore because it might offend somebody. They don't preach on hell because that might offend somebody. They don't preach against, you know, the stuff that, that, that the Bible straight up calls wrong, like uh, adultery and, and, and abortion and, and homosexuality. That, that, that'll offend somebody. They don't, they, don't, they don't preach on the blood of Jesus anymore or that cross because that, whew, that could get offensive. Why don't they preach on these things? Because they don't want to offend nobody. They're people pleasers. They want to make sure everybody can come in and just uh, don't have their toes stepped on. Why? Because they want to build up the crowd and let everybody have a good time. And sure that, hey, everybody's still giving and, and the money's coming in and don't want anybody to get offended and leave because they'll, they'll, they'll take their money with them, right? What did Jesus call? What did Jesus say about these people? These preachers. Remember, he calls pastors. But he even told us that there are shepherds and then there are hired hands, hirelings. Jesus tells us in John chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. He says, the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand or a hireling will run when, the, when he sees the wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. You see, you have hirelings in the ministry today and you have shepherds in the ministry today. A shepherd cares about people. A shepherd cares about people so much that they will preach the truth, knowing it's going to offend. But if they don't preach the truth, then that person could leave that sanctuary or leave the presence of that minister and not know that they are in sin and leave this world without the, the, the salvation that God offers. You see, a good shepherd realizes that the, that the blood of people is on their hands. And they have, the, they have the responsibility to preach the truth. And if it offends, so be it. God, touch that heart. Draw them to you. Save their soul. But I have to de deliver the truth. If I don't deliver the truth, then I have failed to warn people. People's blood's on my hand. When I knew the truth and I didn't give it. A hireling don't look at it that way. A hireling don't care about the people. The hireling cares about himself, herself. The hireling's in the ministry to build up their name. A hireling is there to make money. If you keep everybody happy, that means the money's coming in and everything's okay. And the sad part about this is, my friends, we have hirelings in the ministry today who's try who are trying to build up their name. It's not about Jesus. It's not about the people. It's all about their name, their ministry, and them getting more money. Again, Peter's saying here, how do you identify a false teacher? Out of their greed, it's all about money. Jesus says they're hirelings. Now, this is ugly, isn't it? This is truth, but it's ugly. And this has caused a lot of people in the world to look at the church the wrong way and judge all churches as uh, money-hungry, that's all they care about is getting money because there have been televangelists and preachers who have been caught embezzling and just this ugly mess. But it's a reality that we need to keep talking about and realize this is, this is happening. Preachers out there on TV, oh, if you want a blessing, send in $1,000. If you want a bigger blessing, really? There's money tied to God's blessings now, really? And it's made a bad name for so, so much of God's, many of God's people. And it's just, it's, it's, it's sad. But that's why we're talking about it tonight. So that it won't happen to us. So that we won't get caught into one of these false teachings, false, false prophets and, and get hurt. Amen. Jesus, uh, and this will be in closing Jesus, when he was talking about false prophets and teaching on them in Matthew chapter 7, he says in verse 15, Beware of false prophets 
who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. And that's what's so sad. You know, you can't really tell a false prophet or a false teacher because they come blended in the church. They just, they look like they're part of a the, the, the Christian family and, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're right there with everyone else. And it's just like, we're all sheep. And it's like, and then, and then next thing you know, they start opening up their mouths and it's like, whoa, what was that? He says, they look like sheep, but inside they are vicious wolves. Their motives are crooked and wrong, attitude wrong. Jesus says, you can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree, tree cannot produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. So this is how you identify a false teacher, according to Jesus. Hey, if they're speaking things and you're feeling like there's this check in your spirit and there's some red flags, hey, just just check out their fruits. You'll know a tree by its fruit. They're speaking in the name of the Lord and they're saying they got God and the fruits aren't matching. Something's going on there. What are the fruits we can look at? In closing, Galatians 5 Verse 19 through 24 gives us the fruit of the Spirit and the fruits of the flesh. All right. What fruits are coming from the lives of these false teachers? He says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. He says, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. So what kind of fruits are you seeing come out of this, this minister or this ministry? Are they good or bad? Jesus said you can tell those false prophets by their fruit. Because because they're going to be bearing some bad fruit. I don't care what's coming out of that mouth, right? They might be saying they're speaking for God, but if their lifestyle and the actions that they're doing, if they don't bear witness of a spirit-led life, then that's a false prophet. Amen? Amen. Jesus has told us before, and now Peter's warning us about these false prophets. We're going to get into the judgment. Ah. Peter lets us know that, man, it's not looking good for these false teachers all on Judgment Day. And he gives some examples from the past. And uh, so we'll jump into that next week and we'll see how far we get down into that as we continue talking about dangers to the growing Christian. Let's pray, y'all. Thank y'all again for joining us tonight. Uh, let me just pray a blessing over you, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much for your word and for giving us this knowledge tonight so that we will be aware of false teachers and false prophets. And Lord, I pray that the blessing of studying your word tonight will just be poured out upon, Lord, the, those beautiful people that are joining us tonight, Lord God, and may it be manifest in just wisdom, Lord God, and discernment. As Lord, we live in this crazy world where everybody seems to have a platform and so many people are saying they're speaking for you but God, with this wisdom that we have tonight, may we, may we see through the lies. 
May we be drawn to the truth and edified by the truth, but God, may we, may we see through the lies and know when we're hearing false teachings, false doctrines. So bless your people right now, Lord God, with this wisdom tonight that will cause them to stay focused on you and stay straight on that path, Lord God, that straight and narrow path of truth. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your presence tonight. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your teaching. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless y'all. Hope y'all have a wonderful evening. And uh, don't forget the food pantry, Harbor of Hopers. If y'all want to donate to that, it'd be a, a great thing. Uh, we're getting to help a lot of people in the community. And then Sunday, we're fasting and we're praying for our country. Uh, the election, we're going to be a praying. That's going to be a prayer service. Uh, so it's going to be called a solemn assembly. So come just ready to seek the presence of God. Love you all so much. God bless you.